ID in Christ. That's what grace gives you, and that's going to be an empowerment to understand that. And then, then halfway through, we're going to switch and, and go into semester two and talk about Christ in you, your new life. And those two things are certainly grace rightly applied that changes everything. In the scripture that we just read, the Apostle Paul starts out by giving the gospel and, and that he delivered to the Corinthians. And, and I want you to start there first at the beginning of that chapter so that if the case there's someone among us that doesn't know for sure they're saved, that they actually have eternal life, or maybe they've heard about being saved and, and don't know if they are, that this verse... The, What Paul says in here, when he says in verse 1 again, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. If you receive the gospel, you stand in in the truth of this gospel. And the way you stand is in verse 2, or how you stand is in verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. So if you don't believe in vain, but you believe what Paul preached unto you, I'm not saying you're saved. God's word says you're saved. If you believe this. And here's what he delivered to them. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So that when when Paul talks about that, he's actually saying four things. He's saying Christ died, but don't just say Christ died. Christ died for our sins. And, and then he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So that the gospel message is the fact that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was a payment for your sin. He died as a substitute in your place, paying for your sins, and he completely paid for all your sins. That's why the Bible would say that he is the propitiation for our sins. Full satisfying payment. That Jesus Christ, God becomes man and goes to the cross and before that lives a sinless life but goes to the cross and dies on the cross not for his sin but for your sin. And he paid for your sin so that salvation is a free gift to you and it, and it becomes yours the moment you believe that message. When you trust what Jesus Christ did and you understand that was your, he died for your sins, took your place, paid for your sins on that cross, and you trust that for your salvation, this verse says you're saved. Now the Apostle Paul was the last to see him in the resurrection as he talks about how the other apostles saw him and even 500 brethren at once saw him. But the Apostle Paul, when he says that he was the last to see him and he's not meet to be called an apostle, he says in verse 9, it says, because I persecuted the church of God. And if you know your Bible, you realize that, that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the 12 apostles continued to minister to the nation of Israel and they were witnesses of his resurrection. But Saul of Tarsus did, didn't want the name of Christ mentioned in Jerusalem or even up into Syria. And he's trying to stamp out the name of Christ because he didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. And it was there on the road to Damascus that Jesus Christ, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, revealed himself to Saul of Tarsus and called him to be the apostle to us Gentiles and to give him the message of our salvation, that that message that he said he delivered, that he also received. that God called him on the road to Damascus to bring to us the message of salvation. And that message of salvation is a message of grace that we've already been going through Romans and realizing that we're justified freely by his grace, the grace of God, through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Grace is unmerited, undeserved mercy. And when Paul says, I am not meet to be called an apostle... Because I persecuted the church of God. He persecuted those who would believe in Jesus Christ. And, and in himself, he is not meet. He's not fit to be an apostle. But he is an apostle. And that's why the next verse says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by the grace of God, Saul of Tarsus was saved by the same message he delivered to us, believing that Christ died for his sins. And, and no matter how great those sins were, they were paid for by Jesus Christ. And... The fact is that that same grace that saved him called him to be an apostle. 
And that same grace worked in Paul in such a degree that he says, By the grace of God I am what I am, and the grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. And he's not bragging about his own efforts and that he's a harder worker than everybody else. He's saying what caused him to work so hard that he labored more than they all. He says, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. That grace so touched his life in appreciation of his salvation and realizing the grace message of salvation that wasn't just for Israel, but it was for all of mankind that Jesus Christ died for all. So that the Apostle Paul was so motivated by the grace of God, not only to believe on Christ, not only be saved, but to labor so abundantly as he did. And you just read the book of Acts and look what Paul went through and the sufferings he went through. And he said that wasn't him, that was the grace of God in him. So if you want a testimony from the scriptures that grace rightly applied changes everything, you just saw it right there in the Apostle Paul. And, 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 and while that's a truth that's pointed out here in another verse that we'll look at a little bit later that's quoted so often, everybody understands the, the dynamic of the verse, but uh, Galatians 2.20 when it says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, that those verses explain um, the power of grace in our life. But the foundation of how grace works in our life is actually found in the book of Romans, starting in chapter 6. So I'd like you to go back to Romans chapter 6. And that's actually before Corinthians, even though 1 Corinthians was written before Romans. But the book of Romans does lay out the foundation of not only of our salvation, but also of our service, and first of all, even before the actual what, what God would have you to do, the empowerment and, and the grace motivation for the service. Now, we're going to look at Romans, and, and really, I, I'm going to keep it, we, you know, you could go a lot deeper into things I'm going to talk about, but I really do just want to get those two facts across to you about your new identification in Christ when you get saved, how, and how that empowers you. And then, uh, and then how when you trust Christ as your Savior, the life that you're given is Christ himself. And that changes everything. And, and, and so we want to get that across. But one of the ways I want to do it is we think about this class curriculum idea that we have set up here in just looking at Grace 101 and 201 and 301 is in the book of Romans, you, you've heard of outlying different ways. Everyone can see there's like a four-point four outline that would outline the book of Romans, and you would de declare maybe different ways for whatever you're trying to get across. What I want you to understand is in Romans 1 through 5, and if you know the book of Romans, it'll be real easy for you to see this. If not, jot these ideas down, read the book of Romans, and it's not hard to see it. That in Romans chapters 1 through 5, you learn about salvation from the penalty of our sin. Now, that's grade school. You trust Christ as your Savior, and then you start reading the book of Romans, chapters 1 through 5, and you understand perfectly and completely how God saved us from the penalty of sin. When you come to Romans 6, 7, and 8, you, you learn about salvation from the power of sin in your life. And I want to call that college. And uh, it fits my outline, that's why. <laughs> Then in Romans 9, 10, and 11, if you're not really familiar with that, at least come over to Romans chapter 11 so that you can see what I'm saying here, is that what you learn in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is about the dispensational change that God, when he called the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus made him Paul the apostle of the Gentiles, God postponed his dealings with Israel until a future day and began what's, what the Bible calls the dispensation of the grace of God. And so Romans 9, 10, and 11 explains the dispensational change that took place and what's happening today and how it's going to culminate in the fullness of the Gentiles, which is a time in which we're going to be raptured out of this earth. But So in Romans chapter 11, if you look at verse 25, it sums it up saying this way. It says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. This dispensation of grace is a mystery that was hidden in God and not revealed until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul, that, that God in time would postpone his dealings with Israel 
and send Paul out and call out Gentiles from all nations, people from all nations, to believe on Jesus Christ and to be saved. And as you'll learn about that ID, that you become a member of the body of Christ when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And, and, and when Paul says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that God has set aside Israel and turned to us Gentiles, he says, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and so all Israel shall be saved. The fullness of the Gentiles is when God brings to completion and brings us to the fullness of what God has called us for, then God will go back and finish his dealings with Israel, and then they'll come into their fullness. So I, I just read that verse to you so that you realize that if Romans 1 through 5 is, is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 6 through 8 is the power of God, uh, uh, the power uh, uh, of salvation, the salvation <laughs> from the power of sin, that Romans 9, 10, 11 is salvation from the presence of sin. Because it, it takes us with the interruption of what God interrupted with the nation of Israel, brings us all the way to the fullness of the Gentiles till we're raptured out. Now that's graduation, right? But that's not the graduation. That's graduation in the glory. And, and, and the reason I say that is so that you'd realize that when you go from the college, Romans 6, 7, and 8, that the rest of this life until we graduate to glory, you go to college to learn how to function in life, right? And so when you get to Romans chapters 12 through 16, and just go to Romans chapter 12, Here's where you're out of college, you haven't graduated to glory yet, and you've got to live through life. Now, here's how you live through life. And you live through life with a, a renewed, a transformed life by a renewed mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, brother, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So you've been trained, it's like when you go to college, you, you learn how to do a job, some kind of trade, and then when you graduate, then you've got to go do the service, right? So this is where until we go to glory, till we're raptured out in glory, Paul's beseeching us concerning our reasonable service. And he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That there's a service that God, how to live in this life, and Romans 12 through 16 is going to tell you about every situation you'll face in life and how to deal it, how to deal with it, what God's will is in those situations, whether it's government, whether it's people outside uh, the body of Christ, people within the body of Christ, and, and how you're supposed to deal with all these situations. All of it is found there in just those, those chapters in the book of Romans, so that after you've been through college and until you're gone to glory, it's time to go through, live out those things in Romans chapters 12 through 16. And basically what you're doing with that renewed mind, the renewed mind begins how, in college here, and now becomes a reality in life as you practice it in Romans chapters 12 through 16. And, and really what you're doing, it's summed up in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. He says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision to the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Your, your function in life, your, what we're going to be trained by going through college to do, is to live through life putting on the Lord Jesus Christ in this life before you receive a glorified body and, and, and God takes us into the heavens for the exaltation of Christ in the heavens. So, before, for you to be able to do that, we need to go to college. So go back to Romans chapter 6. And let's start on semester 1, which is your new ID in Christ. Verse 1, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? What, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? Now, we didn't go through chapters 1 through 5, but Ted did that yesterday, covering the gospel of our salvation and the riches of God's grace and salvation. But, but we did it in kind of a short way just by starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. What chapters 1 through 5, it takes us and explains the salvation and how we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ because he paid it all and he's, he's everything that's required for salvation. That he's the full propitiation for sin. And people would ask, you know, you got that verse 20 of chapter 5, 
Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And when people say, well, wait a minute, God so completely saved me from sin by his grace, well, wouldn't that just cause me to go out and live in sin? So ver- chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace should abound? <laughs> so he anticipates the question and tells you, okay, is that really the way that you should think? <laughs> and, I, and, and no one really ever really thinks, yeah, God saved me from sin so I could continue to live in sin. Now, there, people ask the question, but everybody understands that's one of those foolish questions in the Bible. God didn't save you from sin so you could sin. If you're saved from sin, then God's also got a plan for you to live apart from sin. And uh, he saved you from the penalty of sin. That's why we addressed it that way. Now we're going to talk about being saved from the power of sin. But when Paul does that, he says in verse 2, God forbid, so he answers the question. No, that's not the idea. But then he says this, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, He makes a statement. Now, the statement will be explained in just a moment. But in verse 3 is a real important verse. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. He says you can't continue in sin because you're dead to sin in verse 2. But then when he says know ye not, there it's possible that you haven't got you haven't been taught yet that you have been baptized into Jesus Christ and when you were baptized into Jesus Christ you were baptized into his death that's how you're dead to sin because you've been baptized into Jesus Christ and so apparently it's extremely important for you to know that you've been baptized into Jesus Christ and baptized into his death in order for you to be empowered not to live in sin and, uh, and, and so that's why he begins that question, no, you're not. This is something you're supposed to learn. So you're out of grade school. Now you better learn this about when you got saved, something happened, and that you actually died to sin. And, and that's explained by being baptized into Christ. Now, th- uh, this is not water baptism. And the way you know that is when John came around, John baptized with water. Water baptism is being baptized into water. But this is telling you that you were baptized into Jesus Christ. That's an interesting concept. But you know the word baptized, it, it, it carries the idea, it, a synonym of that is to be identified. And, and it actually carries another thought of initiation. To be baptized is to be, is to be identified with something. And certainly John the Baptist, when he was baptizing with water, had a program to identify Israel to their Messiah and, and which ones were going to belong to the Messiah and so forth. But, but the baptism here is a baptism that is going to identify you with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's also initiation. It's bringing you into something. And, uh, and one of the things that I've shared here, I know I have because I'm always amazed by this, is every once in a while you find these sports casters, and I don't know why it's always seemed to be in sports, that, that has a good vocabulary. And they'll talk about a pitcher. I've heard this more than once now, where someone who's on a new sports team or something is coming out for the first time, he's going to pitch the first major league game or he hit his first major home run, and they talk about it as his baptism into the league. And, and what they're talking about is his, uh, you know, he's, not, he's been already accepted on the team, but this is his initiation into playing with the rest of the team. And so there's, you're being initiated into something. And, and when you read this verse here, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. You've been identified with the death of Christ. We already said he died for your sins. And when you trust that, you're identified that his death is your death. And you died with him because God the Holy Spirit, the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says, by one spirit, are we all baptized into one body? Whether we be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. 
When, the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God the Holy Spirit places you into Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about a new ID, ID that you have, a new identification that you have the moment you get saved. It, it goes on in, in 1 Corinthians, after it says that in chapter 12, verse 13, it says in verse 27, it says, Now ye are the body of Christ. So when you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you're baptized into the body of Christ, and you're identified with Jesus Christ. You're identified with His death, His burial, and resurrection. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And now you've died with Christ. The wages of sin is death. You trusted Jesus Christ as be your payment of sin, and you've been baptized into Christ's death and His burial, and as Christ was raised from the dead, you're now to walk in a new life. Because as you're going to see when we move on here, you have a new life. But, but here he's emphasizing your identification with Jesus Christ in his death and his burial. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together, and you talk about, you know, death, he, he died for our sins, so the payment of sin is made there at the cross, and when you trust that, you're baptized into his death, that payment of sin is made. The burial that takes place after that is putting away of sin. When someone dies, you put that away that person away, otherwise they're going to smell and all. But so, that, so that's the putting away of sin. And you're waiting for the resurrection. So in verse 5 it says, For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this. So, you know, you don't learn this right away when you get saved. You, you get saved, you just believe, oh, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior because I can't save myself. And then someone tells you that Jesus Christ died to pay for your sins so that God could give you the gift of eternal life, so you trust that. But then you need to grow up after that and learn some things like this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You, you need to know that. That your old man, the old you, you're dead. And you're disassociated from the body of sin. It's destroyed so that you don't go around serving sin. Recognize it to be dead indeed unto sin. Well, verse 11 there, likewise reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you can't reckon that until you know what they just said in verses 6 through 10 there actually. Uh, verse 7 says, <laughs> it, uh, verse 6 says, Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. But uh, for he that is dead is free from sin. You, are you dead? If you trusted Jesus Christ and you're baptized, placed into the death, burial, and resurrection, identified with his death, burial, and resurrection, you're dead to sin. And if you're dead to sin, you're free. You're free from sin. You shouldn't serve it. So you begin to learn your identification in chapter 6. And, and that identification then works out in a practical way when you reckon it to be true. Uh, in verse 17, it says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Well, that's what you were before you were saved. You were in the flesh. The only thing you could do is serve the flesh and, and sin. So that, notice that's past tense. Down in verse 20. It says, for when ye were the servants of sin, that's before you got saved, you were, you were free from righteousness. <laughs> you didn't do righteousness, you sinned. What fruit, the question here, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But being now made free from sin and become the servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Why is the end everlasting life? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you understand that you're not a servant to sin anymore because you're dead to sin. And when you reckon that to be true in your life, you won't give in to the flesh and serve the flesh. You need to realize that you've been identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that you can no longer serve sin but serve the Lord. You need to have that thinking, that reckoning in your mind. And that happens when you identify. Now, has there ever been a time, now I'm not sure exactly where you're at in your life, and, and you might be wiser than to think this way, but has there ever been a time in your life that you wish you could just start life all over again? 
Now, I say, why, in my thinking, I'm thinking, nah, I'm liable to make bigger mistakes than I made the first time. <laughs> so, so that really doesn't do, do too good. But there could be some things that really haunt you in life. Some actions that you did that just haunt you, that if you could live life over again, you would never do. Because in your mind, you're identified with that action. There could be things in your life, perhaps associates, <laughs> groups that you hung around with. Perhaps a gang that you hung around and were identified with that gang. And if you had your life to do over again, you wouldn't hang around with that group. You wouldn't have joined that gang because it would have had an effect on your life. It would change maybe some of the things you did. So sometimes you're actually marked by the court system, a felon. And now you've got an identification that you go around and sometimes you have to report that in applications to different things. And if you, had, if you could do life all over again, you would avoid being a felon or, or whatever it is the courts have marked you with. Perhaps you rose to success in some business and it haunts you the way you got there because everyone knows how you got there and you do it differently if you could do it all over again. But you can't do it all over again. And, and so there's always the different sins of the flesh that, that, that could haunt you about those things. But that's what we're talking about, that when you get saved, the reality is you do have a new identification. It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And I know a lot of people look at that verse and think, okay, all my habits are going to change. That's not what that verse is saying. He's saying, henceforth, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. God has made you something new. He's taken you and he's taken your, you reckon you to be dead with Christ and now alive with Christ and you have a new identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of God takes you and puts you into Jesus Christ and identifies you with Jesus Christ and everything that Jesus Christ is and everything Jesus Christ accomplished. I have a list of things. There's like 31 things in this, 30 things or so about that we have redemption in Christ and, and the spirit of life in Christ. Uh, the love of God that's in Christ, uh, we're in the body of Christ, sanctified in Christ, made alive in Christ, we triumph in Christ, we're new creatures in Christ, we have the righteousness of God in Him, in Christ, there's liberty that we have in Christ, we're children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, and therefore we put on Christ, it says. Uh, we were, uh, were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ and chosen in Him, uh, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. We're accepted in the beloved. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're created in Christ Jesus. We're made nigh in Christ Jesus. We rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. We're found in Him having His righteousness. Um, in Him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily and we're complete in Him. We're perfect in Christ. We're dead in Christ and, and been raised with Him. We have uh, the promise of life in Christ Jesus, purpose in Christ Jesus, um, eternal glory in Christ Jesus. But this Philippian verse, Philippian, uh, Philemon 1, uh, well, just one chapter, verse 6 says, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. When it says that the communication of thy faith, the truth of your faith lived out in your life becomes effectual. That effectual has to do with God accomplishing it in your life. Remember Paul said, it wasn't me, it was the grace of God that's in me. That happens, according to Philemon there, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That's why in Romans 6 it's so important to realize that when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're identified not as, an, as you were, as your old man, but you're identified now with Jesus Christ and all that He is. And you need to know that's a reality so that you don't identify yourself as a felon. Or, you know, you go through that verse and those passages in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and it says, The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. Uh, and he names fornicators, adulterers, effeminates, and abusers of the men. And he lists all kinds of sin, and then it says, Such were some of you, but you are washed. You are justified. You are sanctified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That you no longer identify yourself as a drunken or a fornicator and all the things that haunt you in your sin. You identify the fact that you're righteous in Christ Jesus. And that identification gives you the power to start living apart from sin and live as a servant unto God. It, it, but, but it wouldn't happen if you didn't know that God has 
placed you, baptized you into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now look over in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 verse 1 says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak unto them that know the law. You know how everything, you got to know something here? He says, How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For a woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Uh, so then while, if while she, her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she shall be free from the law, so she shall be no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So you get the idea that a woman married to a man, as long as he's alive, he's her husband, and if she went with another man, she'd be considered adulteress, adulteress against her husband. But if her husband be dead, she's not an adulteress. She's free to marry someone else. Verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. His death becomes your death, and in so you were, you're, it's like you were married to your flesh, and the law worked on that flesh, and you're bound. But we just learned we've been baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So we've died by the body of Christ, so that this could happen, that we should be married to another. And that's not married to the flesh, controlled by the law, but that's, that other that we're married to is even him who was raised from the dead, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the flesh did work in our members uh, to bring forth fruit unto death. But now being delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, we should serve in newness of spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Again, I, what I want you to see in that is that you're cut away from the flesh so that you could be joined unto Jesus Christ. And this isn't like someday that we're going to be the bride of Christ. This is what the Apostle Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 5 about the great mystery of, of, not, of marriage when he says, uh, a man shall leave his father and mother, his mother and cleave unto his wife and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ, concerning Christ in the church. The great mystery is we are already one with Jesus Christ. Not waiting to be joined with Christ, we already have that. And the purpose we have it is so that we can bear fruit. Your joining to Christ is powerful. It, when you understand that truth, that you're no longer associated... Notice, in case you haven't seen this, Romans chapter 7, look at verse uh, 5. For when ye were in the flesh. Doesn't that apply? You're not in the flesh? Now, he didn't, he's not going to say that to Romans chapter 8. <laughs> but I was reading this one time, I thought, hey, he's, he's already implying Romans 8 back here in Romans 7. That you're not in the flesh. That he, God has so taken and, and, and identified you with Christ that you're not identified with your flesh anymore. You're identified with Christ, and the purpose of that is fruit. Now, that's real important for what I want to get across to you because God is not interested in artificial actions, artificial fruit. See, the law can make you do things that look like and act like a Christian, and it's just nothing but manipulation on the outside. What God is, God is a creator who creates life. And what he wants in our, in our life is fruit in our life, re reality. And that reality comes when a person realizes that they're joined to Jesus Christ and one with him. And the truth of that then produces fruit, not just artificial, it's really the life of Christ then being lived out. Now that's powerful, and I, I guess I need to explain it this way. Um, have I told you about my grandson, Billy? <laughs> well, <laughs> I can use him as an illustration now. <laughs> See, my la his last name is McLeod, and uh, I don't want to get into this part, but uh, unfortunately, when he was conceived just eight weeks, his dad went home to glory. Uh, tragic medical kind of accident, but uh, well, unexpected, but anyhow, it, it allows me to make a couple illustrations. One is Billy is now approaching a, a 11 months old. And all of a sudden, you can see the Adamic nature. I thought he was an angel. 
But around our house, when we see that arise, we say, that's the McLeod in them. <laughs> and because we're now more involved than just grandparents, Sanja and I, uh, we're pretty much involved in his life, and we're going to raise him as a brochet. <laughs> now, that means something. Because as he starts developing in life, he's going to know how a brochet thinks. What a brochet does, brochets go to church on Sunday. And, and what brochets, how we think, how we act, what's appropriate to be said, what's appropriate not to be said. Uh, he's going to have to be taught all that. But he's going to learn that because, the way I'm saying it, he's a brochet. Now, that'll be his, his first identification that he's going to learn. And it's really his first life. And, uh, and as he grows, there's going to become a time, and I hopefully, hopefully sooner, better than later, that Billy will someday understand the truth of Romans chapters 1 through 5. And he'll trust Jesus Christ as a Savior. And he will get a new identification. <laughs> oh, that's far better than a Bruchet or a McLeod. And in that new identification, he's also going to receive a new life. But in that new identification, he's going to learn what it is to be, to belong to Christ. And to be identified with Jesus Christ. And, and, and as he does that, it will produce fruit in his life if he grows and understands and appreciates that. One of the ways that you know that that, how that works and that that, that is actually powerful in life is in America... We call it uh, national pride. But really, pride, you know, that's not, a, that's not a good word, really. It's really, we have a national appreciation. We appreciate our nation. And because we appreciate our nation, sometimes the young men of our nation are called on to go to war, defend us. And, and people are, are proud or appreciate the country so much so that they'll give their life for our country. Why? They're an American does that mean something? Well, apparently so. <laughs> for years, people have died for the fact that they were an American and what that means and to, to, to be able to perpetuate that. They've given their life. So to be identified with something is very powerful. In our country, we got, we got homes that are just busting up left and right, children being raised with one parent, and sometimes that one parent is really a half a parent. And, uh, and so our kids really are growing up and have no home structure, no identification. They go out in the street and there's a gang there that's willing to accept them and give them a brotherhood. And they join that gang and because they join that gang, they'll dress a certain way, they'll walk a certain way, they'll think a certain way, they'll act a certain way, they'll speak a certain way. Why? Because they're associated with that gang. So you're, what you're identified with has power in your life. So it's very important for you to learn your identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know one of the most tragic things, and I've run into this a couple times, is someone from a foreign country who was persecuted as a Christian, but what they did is they, rather out of the three major religions of the world, they adopted Christianity and they suffered for it. Then I ask them, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? What do you talk about? So what, what do you mean that you're a Christian? And they'll talk about some Orthodox or Catholic religion that they joined. And what's, what's really tragic there, do you realize they made themselves a Christian because they joined some religious organization? They weren't baptized by the Spirit of God into Jesus Christ. They really aren't one with Him. They just think they are because they've taken a name and gave themselves that name. But at the same time, that meant something to them. Some of them have suffered back in their homeland because of it. And, uh, and that's tragic because they really aren't identified with Jesus Christ. But those of you, those of us who are, who have trusted Jesus Christ and don't give us an, our own name, didn't profess ourselves to be Christian by name, but we are one with Christ in reality because God's Spirit baptized us into Jesus Christ, that ought to have a meaning in our life that would transform our life. Now that's semester 101. Semester is one, uh, the second part of that, the uh, first semester of 201. The second semester, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and, and uh, 
and, and just pick up in verse 7. It says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So we're talking about a man who thinks the only way he can think because he's in the flesh. And, and he can, if he's in the flesh, he can't please God. But, but verse 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. In verse, in verse 9 there, but if ye, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So you're in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. And if the Spirit of God dwells in you, it says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you. You've got the Trinity right there. You're in the, the Spirit's in you, which is the Spirit of God in you, which is Christ in you. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, not only are you placed into Jesus Christ, and that's powerful, but what's life-changing is Jesus Christ is put into you. Both are true. And, and you become one with Jesus Christ, you're identified with Him, and He comes and He indwells you through His Holy Spirit. And when I say it's life-changing and powerful, verse 11, we have a lot of discussion about this verse, in that context... It says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Well, someday you're going to be resurrected, but we're talking about the spirit of God that's in you right now empowering this body so that this body can be used as a servant, as a a service to God. And, and, and so you have both those truths of what you being, of Christ, you being identified with Christ and Christ being in you. Man, that was fast. <laughs> well, I've got to bring it to a conclusion. <laughs> well, you get the point of that if once in all these, these things, once you get to know this identification that's a reality in your life, then you can go over to Romans chapter 12 through 16 and by that transformed mind, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And until graduation day, till graduation to glory, you're taught in Romans 6, 7, and 8 how God empowers your life and what your the new identification in Christ in you so that you put on Jesus Christ and in all the details of life, chapters 12 through 16, you go live it. So when we think about the verse we started with, Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. His identification. He'd been through semesters one and two. And the grace of God which is in me, it says, I labored more abundantly than they all, but yet not I, but the grace of God which is in me. He took the, the positional truth that he has and it empowered his life to become a reality. It became fruit unto righteousness. Come over to, to uh, Philippians. See if I can hit two of these. These introductions, th these truths that we just looked at in Philippians and Colossians are just spelled right out so clearly. But, but, and, and they're used as introductory. When Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, he says in verse 8, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So as you grow in, in understanding, you grow in judgment, you'll be able to make some discernment. That, see there's the cause in verse 9, here's the effect, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So as you grew in your understanding that you can make proper judgment, you'll prove things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere without offense. And then verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. 
which are by Jesus Christ. Paul said, it's not me. It's the grace of God that's in me. It's by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Understanding that position, the more you understand that, causes you to make some right decisions, and the, and the result of your life is those are fruits of righteousness that are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, and we'll conclude with this. It's an it's amazing verse of scripture, but even in verse 19 of Galatians 2, it says, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Galatians 2, 19. Think about the two semesters. I through the law am dead to the law. Well, that's what we've been learning in, in chapters 6 and 7 of, of, of Romans, isn't it? That I might live unto God. There's Romans chapter 8. So then in verse chapter Galatians 2 and verse 20 now says, I am crucified with Christ. Well, there we're back in Romans chapter 6 again, aren't we? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's Romans chapter 8. We're identified with his death, and then his life is put within us. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And what's the result of that? That... And the life which I now live, by being dead with Christ and Christ living in me, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. So that's that's the, the college that prepares you for life. And the formula for that is to learn those things and know those things and reckon them to be true and live in that identification and that appreciation and there's power in that and there's life-changing power in that as well. Now, my message is done. I have a little thing here that just intrigues me and I thought, you might appreciate this, so I'm doing this for your sake. (laughs) This is a... it's, it was on the back of our bulletin this week, and, uh, and, and it's, it's called a parable of twins. And it really, only one part only is close to my message. But li- listen to this and see if it just doesn't intrigue you like it did with me. It says, once upon a time, twin boys were conceived in the womb. Weeks passed, the twins developed, and as their awareness grew, they laughed for joy. Isn't it great that we were conceived? Isn't it great to be alive? Together, the twins explored their world. When they found their their mother's chord that that gave them life, they sang for joy, how great is our mother's love that she shared her own life with us. That's kind of like my message, but a little differently. But but listen to how this goes. As weeks stretched into months, the twins noticed how much each changed. What does this mean, asked the one. It means our stay in this world is drawing to an end, said the other. But I don't want to go, said the one. I want to stay here always. We have no choice, said the other. But maybe there is life after birth. (laughs) But how can that be, responded the one. Well, we'll shed this life cord. Uh, uh, we, how can that be? We will share, uh, shed this life cord. How is life possible without it? Besides, we have seen evidence that others were here before us and none of them have returned to tell us that there's life after birth. <laughs> so, so the one fell into deep despair saying, if conception ends with birth, what is the purpose of life in the womb? It's meaningless. Maybe there is no mother at all. But... But there, but there has to be, protested the other. How else do we get here? How do we maintain life? How, have you ever seen our mother, said the one? Maybe she lives in our mind. Maybe we made her up because the idea made us feel good. <laughs> so the last days in the womb were fulfilled with deep questioning and fear. And finally the moment of birth arrived. When the twins passed from their world, they opened their eyes and cried. What they saw exceeded their fondest dreams. <laughs> We're going to be raptured out into glory someday, huh? There's meaning in life here, 
And there's an eternal purpose we'll learn about tomorrow. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that you saved us from the penalty of sin. And I pray that each person here has trusted your son because there's no other way to be saved. We can't save ourselves. We're sinners. Christ died for us, was buried, and he rose again that we might have eternal life through him. Father, I pray that we'll appreciate the fact that being identified with him by your grace and him in our life by the, the gift that you've given us through grace does indeed power and transform our life and changes everything. And Father, I pray we'll serve you until you call us to glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.